Um, from the midterm. So we've created the midterm uh, in my office, in a big box. Um, it needs to be scanned. So even though we've created it, uh, we don't have the numbers for the aggregate performance. So we don't know what the average was. We don't know your specific grade. So for that, you're going to have to wait. Um, and so the scanning is going to be done today by the nice TA who agreed to do it. And so we'll uh, probably get around to getting you grades by Tuesday next week because it's going to be a long, long weekend. So I know. It's, it's unfortunate, but it takes a while to uh, scan hundreds of exams. So the uh, yeah. So also the uh, on next Wednesday, which is the next time that I'll see you guys, we'll go over the midterm. So you'll have the midterm come back to you. I think it comes back to you through the piazza somehow, where you get to download your scanned copy, and then we'll go over the midterm in, uh, in class. So that's the update from the midterm. How did you find? Uh, how did you find the midterm? Was it too hard? No. Too easy? No. Why don't you, why don't you raise your hand? Why don't you raise your hand if you thought it was too difficult? It's okay. Raise your hand. A couple of people. How many people thought it was just fair enough? Covered everything you said. Okay. And too easy? Yeah, right. Any of those, all right. So we'll go over the exam. There, you know, it was a, it was an interesting exam with lots of uh, lots of questions that maybe you haven't anticipated. Um, so we'll go over how to solve this and what you can do to, you know, to prepare yourself better for the second midterm. So that's the story with the midterm. So overall, here's our plan. So next week we're going to uh, have lab five. Labs are back in session. Uh, programming assignment number five will come out uh, probably by Tuesday. So that's going to be the next programming assignment that you should work on. And of course, we have exercises and readings uh, to go along with the lectures. And midterm, we go over that on Wednesday. And I wanted to emphasize that uh, the, the final exam date has just come out. So you should make note of this on, on your calendar. So the final exam is going to be December 6th, uh, early in the morning at 8.30 a.m. Okay, so make a good note of this. Set your alarm clocks for a couple months from now so that you don't have to So the, the topic that we're going to start now, it's going to be a very different topic from what we've covered before. Uh, it's going to be about exceptions and assertions. So the outline of stuff we're going to cover over really the next three lectures is all listed here. So we're going to be talking about exceptions in Java as well as assertions. Uh, and that's going to be mostly next week. So today we're going to try to get through possibly four of these, four or five of these. And within the class, so we're going to use the following project for demonstrating exceptions. So you should check it out, Robust Account Starter. Just check it out from Lecture at SVN. So, yeah, so that you can follow my set of examples. What are, what are exceptions about? So I have just like a, a few motivating images to show you. So here's a, here's a really in, famous image of Bill Gates uh, doing a demo of one of the versions of Windows. I can't remember which one it is. But he's standing behind a blue screen. Right, so blue screen, uh, Windows crashed, and uh, Bill Gates is out of luck. He's very embarrassed, right? So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have had blue screens in your life. Uh, probably very disappointed about it. Probably had applications crash on you. You know, maybe have seen uh, problems like this, like software update errors, where your latest version of the iPhone can't download the next latest version of the iOS. You know, and then and then has perhaps kind of just annoying errors, right? Like Gmail might say something like, you "Couldn't send your email." You know, okay, I cached it for you. You can just retry it, but. I had a bug, and I ran into it, so somehow you're going to have to recover from it as a user. So all of these are examples of uh, kind of like scenarios that occur with software when you run into problems. And so that you, as a developer, when you build robust software, you have to find ways of dealing with this. You have to figure out, how am I going to deal with the fact that you know, you're running uh, iOS on an Android machine? How are you going to deal with the fact that you're trying to access Gmail you know, from your 
iPad. You know, perhaps Gmail has, has, doesn't have support for your iPad. So there's going to be new scenarios for your software, and perhaps new circumstances. And you're going to have to deal with it when you write software. So how do you make software more robust? And that's really what we're going to be talking about in the next three lectures. So let's just jump right into the code. So this is the robust account starter. And the robust account starter has a couple of classes in it, just real simple things. So here's a public class account. And it has what you would expect an account to have. So it has something like, here's the account ID, here's the name of the owner, here's the balance. And then I can do a couple of things on this account. I can create an account, I can get certain information about it, I can deposit some money into an account, and I can withdraw some money. I can print it. So it's like very basic. And so the, the obviously the most interesting methods in this class are deposit and withdraw. And you learned already that when we write this kind of code, we have to write specifications for it so that people who use the code know what to expect. So if you give me an account that's greater or equal to zero and you pass it into this method, then you'll expect the effects. The fact that you know, the account will be updated to withdraw the amount that I requested. So these are specifications that we write, that we add to our software so that people who use the code know what to expect. As long as they kind of satisfy this requires clause. And if they don't, well, we can't guarantee anything. Right, so the, the line that we've been kind of going so far is, well, if you violate this requirement, what happens? We don't know. Anything could happen. Software could crash, could send email, could not send email, whatever. Right, there's no guarantees. So really, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is what happens when you get uh, values into methods or read certain executions where something unexpected happens. Right, so violations of the requires clause is an example of that. So as an example, I have a set of tests for my account under account tests. And I have tests like this, where I attempt to deposit a negative amount. I attempt to withdraw more than I have. Right? I have these circumstances where my account is given values that it doesn't expect. And so if I run these tests right now, let's just run these as JUnit tests. Look all my tests have. That's great, right? My software works. It works, except that you know I was able to withdraw a negative account, a negative amount of money. So if you're an actual bank, this is like a big problem, right? <laughs> all of a sudden somebody gave you this code, all the tests pass, yet if you were to actually let customers use this, you'd be losing a lot of money. A lot of money, right? So this is like a flaw in your code, and our tests are not helping us. So the question is, how can I make my account class more robust? What can I do if someone supplies a value that is unexpected to me? So what can I do right now? So let's take this deposit example. So I have this requirement, if you satisfy it, then you get the effects. What happens if I give you a wrong value? What can I do about it? If it's on if, to make sure the value is right, and the value is wrong, Right. So the answer is, I could put an if, con if conditional statement. Right. So one thing that I could do is I could say, well, if my amount is greater or equal to zero, then I'll execute this body. You know, otherwise, otherwise, what do I do? Well, maybe I need to change my return value of this. <laughs> so maybe I'll change it to be a boolean instead of a. Instead of a and so here I'll actually return true if it was able to successfully execute. Otherwise, I'll return false if there was a problem. So now this will change my requires and effects. Now my requires is what's my requires? <coughs> Nothing, right? I don't require anything from the user of this code. But this will change my effects. And the effects will change to say, if amount greater or equal to zero, then amount is added, balance is, and updated. And then I would say, 
uh, returns true. Otherwise, returns false. So this code is a little bit more robust. Right now, it could give it any value, and it'll sort of do the right thing. But now, as a user of this code, I have to check for all of these conditions. Every time I call a method, I have to check, is it true or is it false? Is it doing the right thing or is it not? So there's a piece of code here called temporary class. The temporary class is going to be a way of, for us to check our account. A way of checking the account without actually creating a test. So you might not have seen this before, but this, this line public, static, void, main, defines an entrance into a Java application. Right? So, so far, we've been creating tests, and then you've been running tests. But an actual way to actually launch an application is to create one of these methods. You could create it anywhere you want, in any class. And you could have multiple ones. And then you run your application by you know, right-clicking on this, on this class, and then doing run as Java application. So when I do this, this main method is going to execute. And so far, nothing's going to happen. Because when it executes, it just creates an account, and that's all. It stops. Okay. So even though you haven't seen these before, just treat these as a way of, for me to invoke some Java code without necessarily testing it. So now I could do something like a dot deposit $100, and then a dot deposit negative amount. And I could run this, and again, nothing happens, right? I just added some money, I took some money away. And so, you can actually check this kind of deposit thing. So now that I have this more robust deposit, on the client side, I would need to check the return value. Right? So I would do something like, if my deposit of 100, then maybe I'll do, maybe I'll print, I'll print something out. I'll say, deposit OK. Else, print out something to say, something else, and say deposit not OK. this, there'll actually be some print statements that we'll see. And you'll see those down below in the console. Okay, so I ran this and deposited positive 100, so this if condition triggered, right? If I run it with negative 100, then I'll say deposit not okay. So the second condition triggered. So this is okay, except that I have now this really complex nested structure to my if statement. And it works OK if you have just two kinds of things that may happen. So if I deposit you know, positive amount, then return true. If I deposit negative amount, return false. What happens if I have three kinds of things I may want to return? What happens if I have some unexpected error that happens in my addition function? Right, then I have to add extra checks here and then figure out what to, how to handle it. So it becomes very messy when you deal with conditionals. And your Boolean is not sufficiently rich enough to express all the kinds of things that may go wrong in your application. So this is where, this is where exceptions come in. So what I may do is I may check that my amount is greater than zero. And then go back to returning my balance as before. So make this double. But in the case that my amount is incorrect, an amount that I cannot handle in this piece of code, then I'm going to throw an exception. And there's an exception that we've already defined in this project. It's called illegal value exception. And the way you throw an exception is with the following syntax. I have the word throw, and then I'm going to create a new instance of this exception class. So just as before, I'm creating an object 
that has the type legal value exception, and I'm throwing whatever that means. So this line terminates execution within this method. So when I when I run this method and I reach this line, this new exception is created, termination ends, and this exception is thrown back to the caller of this method. So I'll show you what that means. But before we go on, there's an error in my Eclipse. And Eclipse says, you have an unhandled exception. So this is going to be very common. This is a very common theme with exceptions. That when you create an exception, you also have to have some way of handling it. And there's really only two options for an exception. You either handle it here, the place you are currently located, or you handle it one level up in the call graph. So what I'll do is actually pass this exception up to the call. I'll pass the buck. So for that to happen, I actually have to add this declaration at the top that says that when you call this method, you can get back a double, or you can get back an exception. So one way of thinking about exceptions is that they're kind of like abnormal return values. Right? And you have to declare all the ones that are possible for your code base. So now, this method may produce a double in its normal execution, and that's what return statement does. But this method may also produce an exception, and that's what this throw, throw statement will do. So now that I passed the bug, if you look at the temporary class, you'll see that my A deposit now, well, besides the fact that it doesn't return a boolean, here, if I just remove this code, then I <coughs> If I just have this A deposit, then it says that there's an handled exception that may occur if you call A.deposit. So now that I'm using this method, I have to take care of not only the return value, which I as usual, can do lots of things with it, right? I can store it, I can test for it. But now, if I have an exception, I have to do something about it. And I have the same choice. I can either pass it on, or I can handle it. So the way we handle an exception is with a try catch block. So a try catch block kind of looks like this. So actually, I'll just let it. It's much easier to let Eclipse do the work for you. So you can hover over it and you can say surround with try catch. And Eclipse will generate a try catch block that handles the exception. And it looks like this. You have a try. And in this block, you're going to have some number of statements. It doesn't have to be one. I can add more things in here. A few more stuff. And there's going to be a catch. And the catch is going to catch thrown exceptions. So if I have an exception that is thrown in this code, then my catch statement here will catch that exception, will handle it. So if I get an illegal value exception when I run this statement, then this catch block will execute. So this block mm -hmm. executes whenever, whenever an illegal value <coughs> exception generated above. Right. And right now, we just have this one Java statement, but I could you know, do more stuff here as well. And this one Java statement is going to print out the stack trace and note that it's using this exception <coughs> object E. So whatever exception I created in deposit and I threw to my main, it's going to be received here. And it's going to be received as a new variable, e. So now I can do like a couple of things with e. I could figure out where did it come from. I could try to print it out. I could ignore it. Lots of things I could do to handle an exception. So here what we're doing is printing out the stack trace. So I could actually see, figure out what this is doing by running it. So here I ran it. And here's a stack trace. So a stack trace is essentially you know, a trace that tells me where the exception originated and how it came back 
to this to this final destination. So it tells me that my account that deposit, if I go to this line, this is where it was thrown. And then temporary class Java test is where it was received. And then the value, the actual uh, class of the exception is a legal value exception. So by printing this out, it allows me to debug my, my program. And you might have seen these stack traces if you run applications on your like desktop or laptop. Sometimes when a program crashes, it just outputs this long string. And this long string is useful for developers to debug the application. So you can take it and like send it to Apple or Microsoft. And they can say, oh, here's what happened. Right? You went into this method, then this one, and then you deposited negative $100. So these things are very useful for debugging the flow in your program to figure out what, what went wrong. So this is the exceptional, this is how exceptions work. So I could pass a few more things with exceptions. So right now, this illegal value exception just doesn't tell me much. It's illegal value, but value of what? Value of color, value of user's name. So I could actually, in account, pass on a little argument. So I could say something like, deposit cannot be a negative number. So if I do this, and I rerun my program. Then I get a nice little helpful error message that says the positive cannot be a negative number. So this just allows me to tack on a little bit more information with my exception. So now it's more meaningful to them. Do you guys have questions about this so far? Um, do we always put the try and catch thing under the method? No, you can do try and catch anywhere you want. So I, I just chose a name to illustrate this because a name allows me to run my application without actually testing it. So I could do try and catch actually within account or somewhere else. Yeah. Can you only have one exception? I could have multiple exceptions. Yeah. So we'll we'll see a case where there's a couple of exceptions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why does the throw error part not need to be in an else statement? Is it just in an else statement by default? You mean, oh, you mean this guy? Yeah. Yeah, it, so it could be in an else statement. But this return here mm -hmm. terminates execution for my if statement. Okay. And so if I do an else and do this, then it's equivalent. But so because the return has already been stated, it knows that. So if this if runs, it exits. Right, so so putting something underneath without the else is almost acts like an else because it will only execute if the if. Like other if statements underneath that if statement, like doesn't I don't see how the error doesn't get. That's true. I could I could do more things here, and if there's more code, then I would need the else. You're absolutely right. But since the only thing we had was the exception, then this is also. Okay. Yeah. You can explain again how a try and catch differs from if and else. Yes, how does a try and catch differ from if else? So a try and a catch, they do not evaluate anything. In a sense, they're inactive until something goes wrong. So my usual execution flow here is to execute this line, and then execute this line, and then execute this line. And if no exception occurred, then I'll jump down to the bottom. Right, so I will not execute the catch statement. But if an exception happened to be generated, if there was an error for some reason, file does not exist, you know, the legal value was entered, then it'll be caught in here and this alternative code will be executed. And only in that case. So my, my try catch is just a way of designating, telling Java that you know, when you run this stuff, monitor for exceptions, and if they come up, let's take a look and see if I have a handler for an exception. Of course, other exceptions may occur. So here I'm handling just one. Right? There might be a out of memory exception that may occur, which is always possible because you have finite memory on your machine. And if that occurs, then I have no exception handler for it, so it will crash my program. Okay. Or it have to be one to one. 
can have more. You can have more catches down here. Actually, I'll, I'll get to that example in just a bit. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Would you usually put that in the? Why wouldn't you put that in the deposit method? Yeah, so would, would, that, would that make more sense just to pass whatever the like, amount to your try? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Oh, you mean like put the amount that I'm attempting to no, deposit? No, just add account. the try and catch underneath that if else statement. Yeah, I could do that, except that so the reason it passes on an exception instead of handling it here is because it can't really do much. That's the problem. So if you think about a deposit, so your account takes some amount of money in as an argument. And then it attempts to deposit it to your account. But if it has an error, what should it do? Should it convert, you know, make it a positive number and then deposit it? Should it, you know, uh, should it send you an email? Should it log down your account and say that there's fraudulent activity? Like it's unclear, right? So typically you want to handle an exception at a place where you can handle it, where you have enough information to handle it. So currently here, deposit simply doesn't know what to do with it. Which is why it was in the requires clause initially. Right? It was like, I don't know what to do with a negative number. Don't even ask me to handle that. And so here it's saying that I still don't know what to do with a negative number, but the way I handle it is by throwing this error to my caller. And hopefully, I know what to do here at this level. Right? So here I could do, so there's some alternatives here, right? So I could do a couple of other things. I could try to do, uh, a dot deposit, you know, 100. That might be my alternative. First, I try to deposit a negative number. If that doesn't work, I try to deposit a positive. Number. Of course, I'm going to have a potential exception. So I need a nested exception block. So I may uh, decide to surround this again with try catch. So then my code looks really complicated. Right? <laughs> or instead of this, I can say that you know, if this didn't work, and this didn't work, then I'm just going to crash. <laughs> you know, like I, I, don't, I don't know an account that I can't add a positive or a negative number to. So I could do this. So I'll try both. So right now, if I execute this thing, <coughs> I won't get any, I won't get any prints because I'm not printing out the stack trace, right? But at the very bottom, I could do a dot, so I could print out the contents of a system that out and print a string. So I just want to know what my account looks like. Um, a looks like, and then I could say here. So I'm going to execute this code. If an exception comes up, I'm going to execute this code. And then once I've handled the exception, I'll just go on to execute whatever is at the bottom. So what will happen now is I'll try a negative 100. That gave me an exception. So then I try positive 100. And then this is what my balance actually looks like at the end. So it started off with 100. And then it added 100, and now it's 200. Okay? So this is another way. So I gave you an alternative to handling the exception. Instead of printing out the stack trace and then quitting the program, you know, I tried something else. So this is like if you, if you try to send an email, your Gmail client will retry a couple of times. And says, oh, there's no connection. Well, OK, let's wait for a couple of seconds and try again. Right? So this is very similar to that. I, even, I may even do this in a loop, right? I'm going to loop around and try this several times. Maybe my account is in Switzerland, really far away. I wasn't able to access it the first time. I'll try a couple more times. Okay. Any other questions about this kind of starter, starter exception? So let's look at uh, another class. So this is going to be the bank class. So a bank knows about a bunch of accounts. 
So that's what our data is. I have some initializing code group here. And as you can see, I could deposit to an account. And currently it's saying that, well, since we changed the account, we have the same problem. We have to handle the exception. Right? We either have to pass it up to whoever's calling us, or we need to surround with try catch and do something else. So what I'll do here is I'll I'll just say that you can pass this up. If you have a problem depositing, then just pass it up as an illegal value exception. And then my bank class also has a main. So here what it does is it creates a new bank. It deposits some money into the account, withdraws from that account, and then just prints out what the, what the account looks like. So right now it has the same problem where I may deposit to an account negative sum, and so I have to handle it. So we can do the try catch thing here. So if I run this bank account, it'll basically look like this. I get the same exception. The sum deposit cannot be a negative number, but the stack trace is longer, right? Because when I first I call deposit to account, so first I start off in main, then I do deposit to account. And then I reach deposit, and that's where the exception occurs. <coughs> so here, the exception traveled a couple of method calls. Right? It was generated in deposit, and then it was thrown back to deposit to account. So it's thrown back to here. And here, there's no handler for it. So again, there's this throws, throws declaration at the top. So we went back all the way to the bank, to the main main method within the bank call. So exceptions have a, have a tendency to percolate. And they percolate up the call graph. Right? You call a bunch of methods, and then there's some exception that occurs very deep inside your code. And that exception is going to start coming out. It will percolate one level at a time until it finds a handler. Until it finds some code that is able to handle the exception. So, so here, nobody was able to handle it until it got to the very top. This statement. And the handler here just said, well, just print out the standards. We could even just, well, we could just ignore that exception. This is really bad. Right? Because I'm sort of saying, hey, I'm handling the exception. I'll take care of it. Everything will be fine. And then I'm not doing anything. Right? I'm just saying, well, I just want the error to go away. So unfortunately, this is common practice, but you shouldn't do this. <laughs> so I'll take points off if you do this. So this, this is a way of testing, again, whether my deposit was successful or not. And then if it wasn't successful, I get to define some alternative behavior. What happens if my deposit was successful? So now let's do one more thing. Let's try to go back to this account. So we had this deposit, and we threw an illegal value exception if you try to deposit an extra account. But of course, there's the second method, which is the withdraw method. And it has the same problem, right? I can withdraw a negative amount right now. I can basically decide to ignore this requirement as a client, as a caller. And nothing will happen, right? It'll just silently keep going, hoping that you know, the amount that I passed in was legal. So I'm going to have to do the same modification here. Right? I'll have to change this requirement to say, actually, I'm not going to require nothing. I'm not going to require anything. And the amount is withdrawn from account and updated. And balance is returned. If my amount is greater than zero. Otherwise, an exception is there. So we'll implement that in a very similar way. I'll check if I got the right value for amount. Otherwise, I'll throw an exception. I think there's an exception here called not enough money exception. Perfectly neat. So I'll need to import this. Do you need to put a um, 
amount is less than your current balance in the if as well. Because you can't withdraw. Ah, that's a good point. Because that, that was in the requires. Ah, uh, that was in the require. Yeah, but I missed that. So my amount must be greater or equal to zero. And my amount must be less than my balance. Less than or equal to my balance. Great, thanks. So the hex has two components. I cannot withdraw a negative amount of money, and I cannot take more money than I have. And so the exception that I'll throw is not enough money exception. Right, and actually we can make this more interesting. I can say, if my amount, um, if you can rearrange this code, and actually we have the two kinds of exceptions, right, one for negative, negative numbers and one for not enough money. So I can say, if amount, is less than zero, then I'll throw a new illegal value exception. Then I'll say if my amount is greater than balance, then I'll throw not enough money exception. Otherwise, I'm just going to execute this code. So now I'm handling two kinds of errors. And I'm able to communicate about the two different kinds of errors. I'm able to say that there might be an illegal value exception, or there might be a not enough money exception. So this code is more complex. More errors may, may occur. Is it better to use uh, the get balance method rather than use the get balance? Yeah, the get balance, it's at the bottom, I guess? Or is there a get balance method? It's in work? Oh, you mean this guy? Yeah, it's more robust to use get balance. Absolutely. Because if the way I internally represent balance changes, then then that code would need to change. But for now this is okay. Just to keep it simple. So now I have two kinds of exceptions that may occur in this withdraw method. And I can't do anything about them. So I need to, again, add the declarations and say that, well, if this happened, then it can just throw it and throw it to whoever called this method. And the same thing for this guy. So now I have a throws declaration that includes two exceptions. So I can throw an illegal value exception or the not enough money exception. Okay, so I'm defining two things that may go wrong in this code. And now in the bank, I actually have to handle them. So if you look at my withdraw from account call in bank, I have this withdraw statement, and I have to handle not enough money exception. But then it's going to also complain that I have to handle the illegal value exception. So I'm going to add a throws declaration. I don't know how to handle it here. And so it just added the throws for both of the exceptions. So again, we're sort of adding plumbing so that the exceptions are able to come back all the way to the top, <coughs> to a place where we can handle them. And that's going to be in the main method. So here, my withdraw from account, here is where I'm going to actually surround them with try cache. And Java Eclipse was able to generate a try cache block where there's two kinds of exceptions. So now that I withdraw from an account, two things may happen. I may get an illegal value exception or I may get the not enough money exception. Okay. So if I, if I run this, this guy is going to uh, so let's say, let's say I add this factors thing to the top. If I run this code, I'm going to get the deposit cannot be a negative number. And that is triggered in my deposit. It percolated up to deposit to account. And that percolated up to this, to this place. But of course, these try catches, I can actually merge them. So this was mentioned before. So 
Right now, I have two separate statements, two separate tries. But I can actually add the statement. My deposit and withdraw can be in the same loss. So now, I'll actually try to do both things. And then, in case there's an error, I'll be able to catch both errors, like so. So I just merged them. So what I'm doing now is I'm depositing, and then I'm withdrawing. And in case anything goes wrong in between with either of the methods, I'm going to be able to handle them. So I'll handle the legal value exception, regardless of whether it comes from this one or this one. And then I'll handle the not enough money exception at the bottom as well. So I can actually try to uh, specify these a little bit more so I can pass some value here. So I'll say something cannot withdraw a negative number. And then on this money, I'll just say, I have enough money. So if I run this now, I'll get the positive cannot be a negative number. So this first line broke, essentially, right? It triggered an exception. And after that, the withdraw from account did not execute. If I made this a proper amount, though, let's say I made this 10, and then I try to withdraw 50, then what I would get, oh, I didn't get it. So this worked out right. Ah, I think I know why. Probably because my account is initialized with a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so let's 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 make me poor. So I'll just give myself zero dollars to start with. So let's try this again. So if I run this, I get that you don't have enough money. So what happened was my deposit executed successfully, but then my withdraw from account through the exception, and then I handled the exception uh, here, where I printed the stack for the not enough money. Right? So this, this little try catch thing is very flexible. It allows me to catch multiple kinds of problems. It allows me to catch problems that are way deep in my code. So that the intermediate code doesn't need to reason about the problem until the problem reaches a place where we can do something about it. Yeah. If you have both the deposit and the withdrawal failing, will it only give you the one error message or will you It'll always give me the one, because the try catch will handle just the one exception. Once there's an exception, this block in try stops executing. And the execution shifts to the catch. Point. So I'll not try to do the next thing, because there's an exception. Right? I have to figure out how to handle it before I go on. Yeah. Um, what's the best way to determine if you're on the right level to handle it, instead of just throwing it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> so that really depends on design, right? So sometimes the sometimes the exception can be handled at the proper level because you may be um, okay, you might have some knowledge about alternatives, right? Like if you're if you're the graphics card in this computer and you're trying to connect to a projector, there might be multiple models of projectors available. So you'll say, oh, maybe it's an Epson. Let me try to connect to an Epson. Oh, it doesn't work. Let me try a Canon. You know? And so you'll try different models until you run out. Right. But maybe your, maybe your card is dumb. doesn't know about different kinds, of, different kinds of models and projectors. So in that case, I'll say, well, I can't connect. You know, show the user a nice text box that says, try something else. Right? So it really depends on the design of your software and depends on how much information there is at that level where the error is generated. Yeah? Do you always change the required class after adding exception, or is an exception is something that you get after you violate the required class? So your required class is a specification that is used purely to communicate to people. Right? So the reason we write these things is, one, so that we remember them, and so that people can use the code and understand them better. Right? So, if my code, if my intent is for my code to behave differently, then I have to change the specification accordingly. Right, so after I, I changed my code and I actually told you that what I want is to be able to require nothing, 
and then throw an exception if if you give me the wrong things, then then I have to update this specification. And usually they have to match, right? If my specification does not describe my code, there's a problem, right? So there's either a problem with the spec, the spec is wrong, or my code doesn't implement my specification. So they always have to be in sync. Cool. Any questions? More questions? Great. So next time we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about the final clause. Uh, what happens when uh, you have a bunch of these exceptions and you want to you know just have some cleaning phase? You want to have a task that executes at the very bottom, no matter what. So that's what the final is going to be about. And then we'll move on to a search. Great. <laughs> <laughs>